one day, a one-eyed monkey came into the forest. Under a tree, she saw a woman meditating furiously. The one-eyed monkey recognized the woman ascetic. To watch her better, the one-eyed monkey climbed onto the tree. Just then, with a huge bang, the heavens opened, and the god Indra jumped into the clearing. Indra noticed the woman ascetic. Uh -huh. The woman paid him no heed. So Indra, attracted to the woman, threw her onto the floor and proceeded to rape her. Then Indra disappeared back into the heavens. And the woman's husband, a very famous Brahmin, appeared. Doing, 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 doing. He immediately noticed what had happened. So he petitioned the higher gods so that he may get justice. So the god Vishnu appeared. Are there any witnesses? He asked. So the Brahmin said, yes, a one-eyed monkey. Now, the monkey really wanted the woman to get justice. So she retold events exactly as that happened. <laughs> Vishnu gave his judgment. The god Indra has sinned in that he has sinned against a Brahmin. May he be called to wash away his sins. So the god Indra arrived and he performed the sacrifice of the horse. So it transpired that a horse was killed. A god was made sin free. A Brahmin's ego was appeased. <laughs> a woman was ruined. And a one eyed monkey. Was left feeling completely confused about what human beings call justice. Now tell me, would you think justice has changed in 3,000 years? <laughs> Praise God. We've been speaking of justice, we've been speaking of the common good, we've been speaking of many such things. And I kept thinking, is this a new concept? Wasn't there a time, even in our living memory, when people cared for other people more? When the people who had it, who were entrepreneurs, who were the rich, wasn't there a noblesse oblige? However arrogant it was, wasn't there a noblesse oblige? And I remember growing up in a city called Ahmedabad, where Mahatma Gandhi started his movement from. Uh, it was called the Manchester of the East, lots of textile mills, hugely successful businesses, but all of them thinking of how to give back to society. Riches, not for the self, but in trust. Schools being built, hospitals being built, shelter for people, educational institutions. And then suddenly, sometime during the late 70s and 80s, things seem to have changed. But before that, I want to go back to the early 60s. My father used to teach at Harvard and MIT. And by the late 50s, both Harvard and MIT realized that in some period coming soon, India was going to grow. So they wanted to start a business school in India. And they asked my father if he would become the director of the first business school ever to start. And Harvard started what became later my alma mater, the Indian Institute of Management. And I was very young, and I remember sitting on my father's lap and saying, why are you doing this? You know, I mean, why, tra why train people to be managers? And he said, you know, as India grows, poverty will grow. And we need to train people who have the skills and the idealism to go and run public institutions that will transform the lives of those who do not have. That was the goal of the first Institute of Management to start anywhere in Asia. Even by the time I got there, 
16, 17 years later, the idea of the common good of service to the poor had completely disappeared. And what had taken its place was the beginning of what we call globalization, which I call greed, and I, me, myself, and my bank account. I want to, from what we've been listening to, take you to three different models and how they relate to profit. First, think of the home and profit. Then think of the country and profit. And then think of the corporation. And I put the corporation last because, as we know, many trans national corporations are 50 times larger than most countries. Now, when you go to the home and you think of profit, what do you think of? I certainly think of the well-being of the family, the health of people in the family, whether they're being educated properly, whether they're being fulfilled. You go to the country and you've already moved away from this because you are talking in terms of GDP. You are talking in terms of how deep you can drill for extraction of the wealth of the country and so on. So you've already moved. Yes, there is a small proportion of uh, are the poor being fed or not, but it's reduced from the main goal of the family's profit, which was the well-being of people, to 80% take, 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 take in money and 20%. When you go to the corporation, there's nothing about happiness or well-being. It's all about money. Now, if you look at this paradigm, the first is very feminine. It's it might sound like a cliche, but as somebody said, cliches are there because they happen to be true most of the time. I'm not talking women, I'm talking feminine qualities. In the family, the profit is the well-being. That to me is a feminine trait. You go to the country, it's already become masculine. You go to the corporation, it's all macho. The word globalization, the word derivatives, the word capital, these are all very macho terms. So what does it mean? It means that when we sit here talking about the common good, talking about investing in kindness, investing with the heart, we are talking about a feminine form of leadership. And with regret, I have to say that most women leaders have forgotten feminine leadership. I think Gandhiji was a feminine leader. I think Mandela is a feminine leader. It's not about men and women. It's about caring. It's about trusteeship. And I think we need to do, think of that. In those terms, the whole idea of a not-for-profit is irrelevant because kindness is profit. We just don't understand it that way. So we need to redetermine the word profit because profit is not about extraction and grabbing. Profit is about sharing the light. Profit is about not feeling that the next person, by my victory, is being defeated. So we need to talk of feminine leadership and we need to talk of only for-profit institutions because NGOs will be for-profit, they are for the well-being of others. Families will be for-profit because they are for the well-being of people. So we need to redefine those terms. And I would like to ask you, men sitting here and women sitting here, I want you to answer a question for yourself, which is, do you have the courage to become a feminine leader? Because if you do not, then everything we have discussed here will remain just that, discussions sitting on our backsides, yet another conference. <laughs> India is supposed to be, along with Nigeria, one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And I wanted to prove that you can still play the game and not be corrupt. So two years ago, I decided to take part in what is supposed to be the font of corruption in India, which is the election process. The election process generates more black money from the corporates, uses more black money to bribe the electorate than any other place. And one of the election reforms that we want to try and bring in is that all money given to parties is openly declared as money given to the parties. But I decided that I wanted to play by the rules to see if the rules can work. So I went into this, we have a cap to how much each of us can spend. I went out to the people and I said, I don't come from any backing, I'm standing as an independent. If you want a better representative, then you give me 10 rupees each and with that I will do the election because I don't have any money, I don't have any corporate backing. So I went out, met people, I met 200,000 people in a month's time, talking to them, taking notes of what their real issues were. And I fought the election, and I fought the election with the internet, 
putting onto the internet every single day the name of every single donor and where the money had gone. I challenged the 5,000 other people standing for the same election across the country to do the same, not a single person did it. I lost in the male definition of the term win and lose. I won in the female definition because I got a much deeper understanding of what the real issues of the poor and the dispossessed in the country were. And since then, one of the things we've been trying to do is how do you make the dispossessed possessed? Not up down, but from the down up, by giving them a hand, by becoming a facilitator. We have started an organization called Kranti. The word Kranti means revolution. It actually stands for the Citizens Resource and Action Initiative. In India, one of the biggest frustrations, and Mr. DeSoto was saying that, is people don't have the right piece of paper to say, I exist, therefore I can borrow, I can send somebody to school, I can get a death certificate, and so on. How do they get that piece of paper? They go from office to office and spend days and days and months and months and then finally give up because this piece of paper doesn't exist. But the laws show that you can get that. So one of the things we are doing is empowering citizens to take the benefit of the amazing laws that India has, the right to information, the right to employment, the right to food, the right to education, and show them how they can be empowered to access it so that they become the doers. Not that we become the uh, sort of benefactors for them to do, no, so that they become the doers, so that they become the process of democracy which can lead to the common good, which can lead to people putting their minds and heads together. In this whole process, a few years ago, we were worried that upper class youth and the rest of the country were completely apart. So we created a performance taking the lives of five marginalized people and we took it pro bono to a hundred schools and colleges where the elite go and we performed it. The first reaction was, oh, but this hasn't happened since the independent movement. I mean, this changed when India became a nation. And we said, no, there are people out there who live like this. There are the tribals who do not have land rights. There are women who have to carry human shit on their heads every day because that has been their traditional occupation. And what are you going to do about it? And I have to say that going to all those schools and colleges, following the performance with an hour of discussion, we had 7,000 young people who had taken a vow to make a change to other people's lives every single day. We were making new heroes. And this, I think, is what we need to translate into what we are talking about. Unless we make people with a heart, people who want goodness, unless we make them superheroes, we are not going to inspire the young, no matter how many ethics courses we teach in management schools. Today, look at the icons we have. We have icons who are thugs, icons who kill people, icons who dope all the time and take $12 million per movie. Where are the alternate icons? We need to make goodness hip. We need to make goodness into the only thing that young people want to attain. We need to make our good heroes famous by putting them in the movies, by creating MTV shows about them, by seeing that they're on the top of the covers of every sexy magazine, then we will get where we want to. Just sitting here and saying, how can we do it top down is not going to get us anywhere. Second thing is that unless each of us sitting here actually walks the talk, unless we say, let's come back one year from now and I will tell this group of people what I have been able to achieve singly in my personal capacity. I have been able to motivate 10 people, fine, but let's do it. Let's not just sit here and talk and talk and talk and talk. Let's actually do it because every time we do it, it will be a tenfold increase in our tribe and our tribe must increase. Thank you.